a Ming from the Packet Hacking Village. And this last and final talk of the day is uh, sponsored by the Packet Hacking Village. And it is our pleasure to introduce you, Ez Tahoon, for this talk. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. My name is Ez. I'm here to talk a little, a little about AI, because I know everybody got baited here into AI, but the more the merrier, you know. I'll talk more about the use case, less about AI. But before we start, how's everybody's DEF CON? Yeah? All right. Hell yeah. Are you guys more on the blue team side? Anybody here on the blue team? Blue teamers? Holy moly. All right. The whole, this side is blue team? This side is red team? Who's on this side? <laughs> are you guys red teamers by any chance? Okay, what the hell is going on on this side? Are you guys like cloud engineers, network engineers? Purple? Lots of purples. Data scientists? <whistles> Lots of data scientists, all right. Email security, goddamn. All right, that's pretty cool. All right, so a lot of blue teamers. A few data scientists made it in. So thank you for, you know, coming into a talk that has AI in the title. I know that that doesn't work. People usually get scared of that word. I remember at Black Hat, I got sold to while I was pissing in a urinal, and it was an AI. So I was like, uh, you know, like there's a lot of AI, and, and you don't know what the hell works and what the hell doesn't. But the right framework that I will try to push on you today is essentially talk about the use case, less about the tool, convince me about the use case first, and then we'll figure out how to do it, right? So my talk is going to be all about context is all you need. I have a few practitioners here. Uh, there's George, uh, Cesar at Ruby, and there's uh, Harry, CIO at SAP and Square. They're, they're essentially the, the people that I bring in whenever I have to get some validation on the problem. So I'll, I'll try to, you know, throw them a few curveballs every now and then. If you guys want to come up and do a quick intro, that's fine as well. You want to come up? Not feeling like it. Is everybody so tired at five? Is that what's going on? You're drinking a Red Bull and you're tired? What the hell is wrong with that Red Bull? Is it expired? There are uh, stairs on this side. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, you guys, you're fixed. All right. Go ahead, Harry. Ninety percent. Go for it, Harry. Harry Sorori, NS2, uh, SAP, uh, supporting uh, Department of Defense. Uh, it's about a four point five billion dollar project that I'm heading over there. Lots of fun things, uh, especially when you're de dealing with defense and all that good stuff. There's a lot of moving parts there. All right, George. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is George Alcora. I'm the uh, CISO for Ruby Life. Um, I like to tell people that uh, in my job, uh, I work to help people get securely laid. I'm the uh, CISO for uh, well, you probably have heard the brand Ashley Madison. So we run online dating. Ashley Madison's our flagship brand. So that's where I work. Uh, in terms of this, um, well, when I started my uh, cybersecurity career, I worked as a security operations analyst and I dealt with ArcSight. If you guys remember ArcSight? Oh, yeah, I remember ArcSight. <laughs> so this is going to be a really relevant talk. And Ezeldine's been killing it this afternoon, guys. So please enjoy. 100%. I appreciate you. Please grab a seat. Can I make a disclaimer? Oh, more disclaimers. I don't know if the mics are working. Are the mics working, folks? If you may enable them, that would be fantastic. This way they don't have to come, uh, come back and forth. So, disclaimer is all yours? I, I'm not a, a subscriber of Ashley Madison, so I could keep my job. Right, yes, yes. I'll find your profile here. Right, none of us are in that breach, huh? Okay. Um, so, the reason I bring in these folks are essentially to talk more about the use case, like, what the hell is going on. And uh, usually if I give them the mic, they start talking about incidents and they tell you, oh, in this incident, we found so much shit. Here's how it started. Step one, we found this thing. Step two, there was this other thing. Step three, there's like this other thing that we found out and we uncovered. And what they're essentially telling you is they have so much good investigators and their team and outstanding contextualization that these humans did, right? So. Context apparently is very important, and let's talk a little about that. You guys are all blue teamers, so I'm not going to bore you with the bullshit, but here's a quick agenda. Uh, the agenda is who the hell am I, and then some challenges, you know, a lot of challenges, a little bit more. And uh, we're going to talk a little about MITRE attack. Anybody knows what's MITRE attack? Oh, everybody knows? Okay. 
Uh, we'll do a quick brief. And then we're going to talk about the what, the when, the who. When you do an investigation, what the hell happened? When did it happen? And who's involved? Tell me all the entities that are involved. Tell me what the hell happened. And if you can do that with models, that's fantastic. If you can't, I mean, do it anyways. Um, do it the hard way, you know? Um, and then we're going to go through some examples. And I, I don't want, I don't know why I put QA at the end. If you have questions, by all means, shout it out. I'm being serious. Shout it out. If you're so polite, you cannot do that. Just raise your hand. I will stop whatever the hell I'm saying and I'll take your question. That's my promise. All right. Uh, who the hell am I? I'm a data scientist. Uh, I used to be a data scientist at the SOC, uh, Royal Bank of Canada, Hawaii, Horn, Cyber Defense, uh, Four Scout, a bunch of others. But essentially, I, I'm a nerd and I do data science for the SOC. What's the problem with cybersecurity? Why does every year we have uh, essentially a much bigger problem? <laughs> Um, I remember I did this a similar talk like uh, about a year ago and I was talking about Colonial Pipeline this year. I'm talking about CrowdStrike. Every, every year there's like something that's way worse, right? So why do things keep on getting worse? And maybe CrowdStrike is not the, the best, but you know, the other ones are not as popular. CrowdStrike seems to be popular this time around. Um, but essentially, attacks seem to be a lot stealthier, right? And the folks here that work at Blue Team, they know the job is not very easy. They came up here because there was AI and there was SOC, and they were like, fuck yeah, somebody's gonna automate my job? Fuck yeah, automate it, man. I wanna, I wanna get another one. Nobody really likes their job in the SOC because attacks are so fucking stealthy and they grow stealthier every year. And guess what? You take the fall because you're the SOC, right? Um, and because you're the SOC, you also have, I don't know how many alerts a day. I stopped, stopped updating that number, but that number keeps on increasing, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, as a human, you can only look at maybe like 20 tickets a day, right? 10 tickets. Anybody here looks at 20 or more? Yeah. Not like there's one guy who's like probably a fucking genius. He can look at more than 20. I can, I actually like blank out after like five tickets. I used to work at the SOC. Like after five tickets, everything sounds the same. You know, I just like, I want to get by. And my boss had this weird KPI of, you know, MTTD, MTTR, whatever bullshit. And it essentially just meant do it fast, no one cares. And they just did everything fast as you know, like false positive, false positive, false positive, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't want it fast, man, sure, I'll get it to you. <laughs> I'll get it in 20 seconds if I have to. Uh, but um, we have so many tools. I was telling you about Black Hat, terrible experience. There's like a shit ton of tools everywhere. Vendors are everywhere. Can't even find non-vendors anymore. But there's a lot of vendors, there's a lot of tools. And somehow security is worse. How did that work? I don't know. Right? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You're on top of it. Like it's give this man a cookie, right? Like you're on top of it. Like it's a lot. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> At five PM everybody wants a Red Bull, right? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like we have a lot of tools, we have a lot of alerts, we have a lot of shit and it's all up to not acquiring more. It's up to people and process, not technology anymore. Yeah, that's also presuming that over that three to four year cycle, you have the same staff and personnel manning your SOC. Let's not forget about turnover, eh? I think we talked at some point about how you destroy your yep. team, but let's not go there. Dude, I'd, I'd fucking buy you a beer tonight. Like, you know what's up and you, you speak it out. Like, I fucking love you, man. Like, that's what's up. So, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yep, we need some of that. We need some of that. A lot of people are, you know. You, you, I, I had so much pain and agony from your end, from, from your game. <laughs> I mean, he, he wasn't a customer. He was post breach, though. Yeah? <laughs> He's post breach. He came in to clean up, but dude, I was in fucking, I, I was in that fucking data set. I'm a, uh, yep. Well, yeah, yep. the, the funny part is I was actually, uh, when that happened, I had started my career in cyber having left military SIGINT 
So I was working at a MSSP, which had a lot of Government of Canada clients. And so the funny thing was in that breach list, there was a lot of at Canada.ca addresses. Oh. So what a lot of people were doing, cheating on their spouses, oh. were actually using their government email accounts, their government work email accounts, to get a platform or get a profile on the site. But then when they got popped, not only was it an issue in terms of their spouse, but now their employer was pretty pissed off at them. And just spam, spam the bit pot, pay us Bitcoin. Yep. Other spam, multiple, multiple ways. So you know, Lost extortion. The, the yep. funny thing is about that. I don't want to derail this talk, but like, <laughs> the funny thing about that is, to this day, I mean, um, they use that old list because Troy Hunt posted it, right? So everyone uses that list and tries to act like it's a, a new breach info or new credential to pop up, but it's like still the 2015 credential. That person's moved on from the site well and beyond, yeah. but they're still trying to run attempts on the old creds. So I, I think it's just, it's a taboo thing. Everyone's been popped. SolarWinds been popped. Like, like British Airways has been popped. How many countless Everywhere. breaches have happened of major enterprises? Yeah, those are the ones that we know that about. They're talking about. Those are the ones we know about. <laughs> yeah. It's just because it's it's got it has to do with sex and everyone thinks it's taboo. It, 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 it was sexy. It had a lot of extortion and <laughs> yep. there was a lot of spamming. Yeah. Hell yeah! I, I went for months, months, months. I appreciate your service, sir. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, I can turn this into a sky talk and we can start ranting. You know, like <laughs> I can fucking rant. No, no, no. I'm, was it, dude, is this dude, turning into sock therapy? Look, sock therapy is valid too. Look at my fucking agenda, bro. It's like old sky talk. It's all ranting. Like the machine learning is like, you know, number 5.8. I'm all about the rant, bro. Like that's, that, it's the use case, right? It's like, what's, what's broken and how do we fix it? Right. But, but yeah, you're on top of it. Like too many tools, too many rules, too many playbooks, too many, whatever the fuck you want to call them. It's just searches, lookups, right? And who has to tune those? The people in the process. But we don't want to buy those. We want to buy the technologies. We want to buy the sexiest shit. And we want to install the sexiest shit. Do we have the right people in process for that technology? Nope. Do we care? Nope. We care about AI because I'm a new leader and I want to put AI in my company. And you guys deal with it until you stop dealing with it. And the company's fucked and now I leave and they get the new guys, right? <laughs> So it's just so bloated and ineffective for a variety of reasons. Most of these reasons are not technology. Most of these reasons are people and process. And since I baited you all with AI, I will give you a lot more people and process today. So what the hell is wrong with our security? Why is it so less secure than what it was 50 years ago? Well, the naive way to think about this is it used to be so simple. It's not even apples to apples. It used to be so fucking simple. Now it's so fucking complicated, right? And to hack Stuxnet, you had a virus circulate the entire world for two years. Finally, someone picked it up on a USB, put it in the, in the printer to print an assignment for their kid and boom, bada boom, right? But in reality, if you want to do Stuxnet today, there's like a smart grid. There's like people selling solar power back to the nuclear plant and some bullshit like that on the smart grid where technically everything is connected and the attack surface is like so much easier. What do you mean we have to wait for two years for someone to put it on a USB? Not anymore. So this is essentially why everybody here is so vibing when we are complaining. Because we are constantly waiting for that talk at DEF CON that will come and automate our jobs and take it away from us so that we can do something else. We don't want to be analysts. We want to be engineers. We want to be architects. We want to be cloud folks. Fuck it. We want to be compliance folks if we have to. Any... <laughs> No hate on the compliance folks, <laughs> but, but essentially like we can, I could be a freaking salesperson instead of being a SOC analyst, you know, like it's, it's shit, but what does it, what does it take for a SOC analyst? What is actually so hard? And um, the expensive folks at SANS, they run a SOC survey and then the SOC survey for the last six, seven years, it's always been the same shit. People go and they vote on what's the thing they hate the most or what the thing essentially is we're going to all hang our trouble on. And it's always, always, always lack of code, code, beautiful, sweet correlation. What the hell is correlation? <laughs> I 
I don't know if someone knows what that is correlation, but it essentially just says like, what that is relevant to what? And it's like so ambiguous that people can sell you what they call correlation searches if it's looking for like two things that it's gonna put together if they fit a specific rule, right? Uh, but that's all good if you have all of your data in one place. How many people here have everything they need in the sim? <laughs> yes, <laughs> nobody, right? Which one? Yes, you, do you want the Splunk or the Elastic or the S3 bucket? Like, which one do you want, bro? <laughs> Damn, okay, which index? Which silo on it? Okay. Yep, yep. Yep, I have a sock for Insider Threat. I have a sock for this guy. I have a sock for the NERC SIP. I have a sock for whatever. I have a sock at the company we bought. It's not technically part of our company, but it's, you know, it's a sub organization. It's like another entity that we bought. They have their own sock and they don't give us the shit. We have a sock that was part of a knock. We have a sock that's called Data Fusion that a new leader made. You know, it's, I know what's up. So, so if we don't have all the data in one place, can we put all the data in one place? Would, wouldn't that be a pretty nice process, right? Like, let's get as much data in one place. And then we start talking about money. Like, dude, it costs a shit ton to get it into one place. And by the way, to get it in one place, I have to put everything in one data model. I have to make sure I have the right, you know, parsers or whatnot. It's 2024. LLMs can actually make you, like, any kind of data model into any other data model. So we have an open source thing. If you go to GitHub, Sipienta, uh, we get anything in any data model put into one data model. And it's also 2024. Storage is so fucking cheap. I don't know why do you have to put it into a sim. Put it into fucking S3 bucket as a cold archive. It's cheap enough. If you can get it all there and you can fight the people to get it all there <laughs> and you can call everybody and get the right data, you can have the dream kind of thing where you have everything in one S3. If you don't get the entire dream, that's fine. If you can get like 70% of that dream, get just like everything into like a cheap storage and the cloud, that'll be fantastic. Because if you have everything in one place, ideally in dreamland, um, and you can pull it off without wasting a lot of money or asking for budget, just put it in cloud, it costs 20 cents a terabyte or something like that, right? On S3. Um, you can essentially have almost everything you need to run these kind of queries, right? Because what do we have in the SOC today? It's 2024. We have the same shit that we used to do before I was born, queries and playbooks. Why? We can trust that shit, right? We can trust it. It's explainable. It's adaptable. It's customizable. It's transparent. Yes. Yep. Yes. That's true. That's true. A lot of the insider threat data cannot be given to the SOC. It's PII's. Yep. The risk is not going the risk compliance people are not gonna let you have your insider thread data there. If you have UEBA, they're not gonna let you have it. If you have endpoints or emails or stuff from Outlook or whatnot, nope, you're not gonna have that in the SOC. No way. But if we can get as close as possible, we can get something there. And the point is we use queries and playbooks because I can fucking trust that shit. Like I trust it. I can see it, I can read the rule. Look at how nice it is. It's so open, it's so transparent, it's so nice. I can actually read that shit. I fully understand when it triggers. It triggers when it finds these kind of stuff in the query. Command, all kinds of commands in my web shell traffic or in my web traffic in general as a post. That's when it triggers. I completely understand that. Can you say that about an LLM? Hell no. How many people here are using anomaly detector? Anomaly detection, UEBA? Two people. It's 2024, right? Like five years ago, a shit ton of people put their money on UEBA, right? What's wrong with UEBA? Why don't you use it? Why do you use it? What do you hate about it if you use it? Oh. I'm definitely buying you a beer today. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 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 100%, come up. <laughs> Hell yeah, come up. Woohoo! <laughs> Can you give us a quick intro? Can we get the third mic running? My dude. Sorry. I apologize. Can we get the third mic running? Thank you. Oh, thanks. All good. Sweet. Thank you for coming up. 
by popular choice. The People's Choice Panelist. <laughs> well, my name's Walt. I'm a 15-year schmo um, in, in, in cyber defense, uh, uh, working for the man. And uh, Uncle Sam? Batman, yeah. <laughs> I love that man. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I started as a SOC analyst, and I'm somewhere between senior SOC analyst and the guy in the office who does ML and plays with the Splunk models and tries to build the dashboards. Oh, so yeah. That's. And yeah, I'm loud and over-opinionated. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. There's a lot of stuff that you didn't say that, you know, I, I can feel it. I was in the sock. I was using Splunk. I used MLTK, DSDL, all of that good shit, eh? What was that? MLTK, Machine Learning Toolkit. Oh, yes. Deep yes. Science. MLTK, uh, MLTK, I like it. It works nicely yep. for, for something that's embedded. Uh, I haven't played with Elastic's embedded machine learning that True. much yet. Um, I can do some stuff in Psych. I, I have done stuff in Scikit-Py. In, in Scikit. Yeah, Learn. Scikit yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a master's. Um, nice. I, I got it last year. Oh, all fresh with all the data science. Hey, uh, and it's it. I went there because there was a need. And hell yeah. Somebody has somebody has to be able to sit there and say the machine learning works for the the, the, the use case and don't don't buy the black box. Hell yeah! That, that's my role in the office. And yes. They ask me if the, if this actually makes sense, then, then I figure out a way we use it. That's amazing. It's like taking my life and just making it a lot more full of experience, kind of thing. You know, like like I I worked like a couple of years in the SOC and then I went into a PhD to solve some issues in the SOC. You essentially worked a lot more in the sock, saw a lot more bullshit. So yeah, I, I'm gonna refer a lot back to you. If you have anything to say, just no worries. Boom, right away. I don't have to prompt you. I'll and, just and, go and for unfortunately, it. Unfortunately, my daughter is now cringing. Oh yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you made it to the con. What did you think? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to the discussion. We love rules because they're understandable. They're transparent. I can customize them. I can fucking give them feedback and they can do whatever I want them to do. I trust them. I will never get fired without understanding why. AI, I'll get fired and I'll be like, why? <laughs> why did it not work? The vendor told me it will work, right? Like, <laughs> so anyways, rules are pretty nice. Have you guys ever seen investigative playbooks? Anybody knows what the hell is an investigative playbook? Okay. So an investigative playbook is a fancy way to say, you know, I have a bunch of searches that go back to back to back to back. And if they're within five minutes of each other, they come all together within a ticket. That's pretty much it. It's like security analytics uh, stories from Splunk or in Splunk, they also now have uh, the risk based alerting. It essentially just means like if something is scored like five out of 10 risk and another thing is five out of 10 risk and they happen within five minutes, boom, it's 10 out of 10 risk for both of them, put them together in a ticket and tell me. But essentially all of these nice things are rules on top of rules on top of rules. And every year, although it's 2020 fucking four, we get new ways to apply rules as if we're in the sixties. Why the hell are we not using any more like things other than rules and solid narrow logic? because we cannot trust it. Okay. So what do we like so much about our rules? What makes us trust them? Well, I can also map them to my Tratak techniques. Anybody here, I'll ask this question one more time, just to, <laughs> anybody here does not know what's MITRE ATT&CK and I will go through it quickly. Okay, let's go through it quickly. So MITRE ATT&CK is essentially an, a way to say what happened when we talk about the what, the who, the when. If I tell you, oh, uh, this vendor says this thing happened, and you don't have a common reference for what the hell is this thing, you don't really fully understand what is it. And a lot of the people in this industry are so scared to ask or say that they don't know. So nobody actually figures out what the hell are they talking about? And they just keep on going and they never ask, dude, I didn't understand that. I don't know what's going on. And just keep on going, right? Everybody acts like, you know, they know it all. And nobody wants to be, you know, like the only person that asked the question. But anyways, MITRE ATT&CK is solving that as a big Wikipedia 
And this Wikipedia is essentially uh, full of techniques and every technique has a procedural example. It tells you how to detect it, how to mitigate it and whatnot. And one neat thing about MITRE is essentially in MITRE attack, uh, you can see that going left to right, you're actually going sequentially. So there is causality going left to right. Damn, I lost my light. Was that me by any chance? That wasn't me, right? No worries. You guys can still see me. I don't need a humongous light bulb in my face. But going left to, going left to right, like you start an initial axis. So this is when I send you like an email and tell you, yo, what's up? You won 100 million Bitcoins. Click here. Um, and then once you click here, a bunch of shit happens, including like execution, persistence, privilege escalation, you know, the whole thing until you end up at impact, right? You end up with some sort of like ransom. Now I'm extorting you. You end up maybe with like some sort of command and control. Now we have something that keeps on moving your mouse or something like that, right? Okay, so that's the fun stuff at MITRE. Uh, one more fun thing at MITRE. At the SOC, we are always talking about single alerts, single isolated, disjointed, siloed alerts. And these are not how people talk about incidents. If anybody here can talk about an incident, that would be nice. I don't mean to pick on you guys, but can you share a single incident that was like a full investigation, like end to end? I know George might share one, you kind of prepared one. Or if you can go for it as well. Whoever wants to go for like a full investigation, like a, some sort of an APT that you can share, some sort of like a... Right. I, I can't share APTs, sorry. The only, the only thing I can share, and you kind of saw or heard earlier. Yeah, he's probably the only guy that will share because DOD, DOD, so, you know. Yeah. This, this is fine because it, it happened years ago and, and right. we weren't like told we had to be classified about it, but like beyond the, uh, the details of it. But basically, we had stopped at my previous employer a series of persistent DDoS attacks that the campaign ran for, I would say, arguably about maybe almost two weeks. And every day we were getting progressively worse and worse attempts at us. So we were getting like higher and higher ping rates. And so it was really uh, crippling uh, the latency of our, of our entire organization, our ability to work. Um, eventually we were able to kind of change rate limiting rules. We were able to change certain configurations within the infrastructure that allowed us to retain uh, traffic flow once again. Uh, and suddenly we found that the uh, attacks had stopped and we, we didn't know, know what happened. Um, we got a weird call, because I'm, I'm Canadian. We got a weird call about, I'd say 12 days later from our public safety department, which is kind of like our, our department that has all the intelligence agencies. And so folks from our, from our CSIS, which is our, our, like our CIA, came up and told us, and they sat us down for a briefing with our senior executives, that we were actually, uh, we were attacked by Fancy Bear. And we'd actually repelled the attack by Fancy Bear, which was fucking wild. Cause, yeah. But really, it, it, what, what they were trying to do is they were trying to take down the ability of our organization to operate because we were helping with uh, research for missile targeting systems uh, and other kind of modern technology that the Canadian Armed Forces were developing. Um, unfortunately, they weren't, well, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for them, they weren't successful. But what was amazing to me was that for us, we just cut to the fundamentals of how to repel a DDoS attack, um, where we didn't know that we were fighting a, a nation state actor. We didn't know until after the fact, until the government came and told us that this is actually what you were up against. Um, to this day, I'm still actually blown away by that because we had no clue. To us, it just seemed like a really, really persistent uh, APT group that you know, was just a run in the mill APT group because it was really just a really annoying DDoS attack um, that didn't really have any special parameters to it. So I, I found that kind of fascinating and, and I don't really think that's a standard APT for them because I, I've seen like, you know, the, the old APT32 blogs come out all the time with some of the innovative, innovative social engineering tactics that they like to use. Um, but I think on this one, it, it, they were just looking at who's part of the supply chain for this project and let's attack every organization as part of that build for that construction. So uh, it's kind of an interesting kind of outlook, but you have to look at when you are attacked by a, a nation state or a large APT actor, you have to look at it from the human level as to why they are trying to attack your organization and what are the crown jewels they're trying to go after. So if they're trying to just disable your ability to function and operate, that's legitimate means of compromise that they're trying to achieve. If they're trying to steal and exfiltrate data, 
that operation is probably going to be more malicious because they're going to actually have to get inside your environment and then move laterally across, probably break access at some point or get some kind of privileged account and then be able to uh, exfiltrate the data to a C2 somewhere without you noticing. So oftentimes you're going to deal with like, what's it called, a, uh, a, 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 a slow... A, a, low and slow? Low and slow, there we go. Oh, low and slow. And that, by the way, for those of you who are playing in machine learning uh, and anomaly detection, anomaly detection is very good at giving you low and slow prospects. Yeah. Yeah. That's been the best use case I've got so far. But they can maintain your presence in your environment for months without you realizing if they do it correctly. If they do it correctly. But at, at the very least, when you're dealing with just trying to find odd traffic that you'll not yep. spot yeah. yep. otherwise, that's that that's the sort of anomaly that you are actually trying to leverage. But most of the people that I know that have UEBA still, but the people that don't have UEBA, they don't have the anomaly detection because they end up dialing it down so much in face of false positives, they miss the slow and stealthy stuff. They only want to see the extra, extra, extra spicy stuff that the rule can get them. And, and, and that, 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 that mindset's part of the problem. The other thing is, you know, for the really loud, obvious stuff, for the fault, which is, generates tons of false positives, you should be tuning your, 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 your inputs to your anomaly detection algorithm beforehand. If if I know this is, and your your analysts should be able to also go through and say right here here's the ones that are, you know this traffic I've seen elsewhere. It's loud. This isn't a good prospect because X, and then you go Y. Hell yeah, yeah. I mean, it goes back to people on process. Like you have anomaly detection there for years. People don't use it because they don't tune it, and when they tune it, they tune it out. They literally just, you know, it's too many false positives. Let's just get rid of it. Because if I have all of the slow and stealthy appearing, I have all of the garbage appearing, you know? So it's a trade-off. Do I want to see all the slow and stealthy? Or do I want to not have a million fucking tickets every day? So there's, I think there's another issue of insider threats, right? Um, two of some of the biggest ones I've seen that I was a part of uh, that organization were people that were either fired or about to quit and they set up the environment and if you don't have that detection um, and someone's doing this uh, setting up of the environment and they're starting to have a bunch of scripts execute to <laughs> create accounts and get into those accounts and piggyback on that and create scripts to start shutting things down or, or moving data whatever it is or both um, you should be able to detect those things before those first people depart. That actually depart. brings me up another point. You should really invest in DLP. Um, data loss prevention is a major issue, and particularly when it comes to insider threat. So I can give you an example. I won't say which employer, but let's say we had to let go of an HR person, and it was a sudden, uh, it was a sudden cut, financially based. Like their performance was good, but we had to let them go. Um, oftentimes when folks are put in that position, they're going to try to smash and grab as many files as possible, perhaps to spin off in a consultancy or do whatever it is they're going to do with their business after the fact. But obviously corporate data, you can't just carry home with you. That's not the way it works. Um, so I knew, I, I knew about a month in advance of when this person was going to get let go. And so I kind of set up a, uh, a surveillance with with my SOC manager and I was like hey can you watch this person can you specifically see what's happening in their endpoint over the next few weeks so it was kind of an interesting process where they were gonna get notice that we were gonna let them go and then there was a two-week buffer window for them to kind of hand off everything and I suspect within that two weeks they would attempt to do a big data expel and what happened it was like I think a day before we cut off all their accounts and everything a massive data exfil. So we ended up getting alerted to what they were doing because we had our endpoint sensors detecting what was going on, that we had seen the files in the transfer specifically, so that we knew exactly by name which files had actually gone out. So we were able to call this person back, be like, hey, can you put those files on a USB and please confirm deleting them from your computer because they belong to the company. All right, so DLP is essentially a bunch of rules, right? More rules that we trust. It's not anomalous, right? Yeah, it's 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 a 
it's a here here we set up the heuristic these sorts of, of files or these sorts of right. indicators and uh, one of the other things you absolutely need is yep. somebody involved in the process to know what what should be happening it, it's the deep knowledge you have to have somebody know what should be happening hell yeah this what's what's odd hell yeah and, and have a clue as to when to really put that uh extra extra yeah, extra scrutiny kind of thing, extra you know. Scrutiny yeah, and that's the context. Context was the boss told you, you know, like this guy's gonna do some shit. That's fucking amazing and tell. Thank you. Somebody's gonna do some shit. I'll look there, right? But if I have anomaly detection, George was talking about that a little earlier as well. He was like, they can be there for months. What does that mean? Anomaly detection, my friends, needs some sort of a time for baselining. It baselines over a month. You have someone that does something fishy every year because they go and they pull financial metrics for the taxes or some bullshit. Every single year you have a ticket. Every single year. doesn't matter. And that's why UABA is not the most popular thing in the world and it will never be because you have to tune the shit out of it, right? And for us, we want to stop fucking hyper-tuning everything. We want to have regular lives. So that takes us to essentially attack flows. Attack flows are incidents that you know, when I asked George to, uh, to talk about an incident, he was like, there was a lot of DDoS, but DDoS usually happens all the way at the end. I know Chris usually has a lot of incidents to share, and sometimes they're all over the place. Sometimes they're only at the end. What happens is if you only see stuff at the end, is you just didn't see the rest. You just didn't put it together. And if you have seen some things but missed a few, you know why you missed them. Because these guys were good and they got your, your essentially, you know, like blind spots in coverage, blind spots and whatever. So most of the investigations try to put the whole story, like give me some sort of an attack flow. Anybody here familiar with a mitre attack flow? God damn, only three people. What the hell is, what the hell is going on with mitre? All right. So I'm going to pitch mitre for you. Here is what they call a mitre attack flow. I can see strategically and mainly a little bit operationally, what was happening at Equifax, for instance. So there was a vulnerability, exploit, whatever, you know, like web shell, yada, 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 encrypted shell. There, there was like a lot of queries to the database. That's how Equifax got breached. And my data is there. If you can find my SIN number, my address, you can find a lot of information about me if you want. Uh, download the data breach and please don't steal my identity, but can't stop you. Um, and God knows I spend a lot of time in the bank whenever I do something because of this, but can't, can't really complain, you know? Um, this is the attack flow, and they archived a bunch of stuff that they got, and they exfiltrated it uh, via C2, non-C2 protocol, via multi-hop proxy and whatnot. If you want to, to watch some more of these, the, instead of APT PDF reports, you can have an APT flow, and you can see the nice strategic movement there. But anyways, why the hell do we care about this? We care about this to tell you that we have been fed our entire lives in the SOC, that an alert is important. There is something called a notable alert to hell with an alert. It's about the story. It's about show me the entire freaking flow. To hell with a single technique. Show me the other shit. That's the context. Show me a piece of intel that the boss tells me, you know, somebody's gonna pull some shit on you. Good. Now I know where to look. Now it's no more a single incident of data exfiltration. It's data exfiltration that I have good reasoning for. This person is disgruntled and so on and so forth. And these kind of stories are very important. And that's what usually goes in an incident report. And that's what people like to talk about when they save the day. You don't save the day against a single incident. I, uh, sorry, against a single alert. You save the day against a full attack. It might be a full playbook that executes in 20 seconds. It might be an APT that's just been there for a couple of years, whatever it is. It's not one thing. It looks like this. So can we do this with data science? You know, I came here for data science, you baited me, and now you're feeding me a lot of bullshit about people process. Give me some technology, my dude, or I'm gonna leave right now. Gotcha. Okay, here's some technology. So we need some sort of finding mitre attack techniques for everything. Why? Because it's a what. If I hire unicorns like you guys, I don't need to detail everything for a what, but if I hire the 20 resumes that I got in Las Vegas, they are all juniors and they need jobs. And we in security like to say that we have a lack of talent. Fuck no. We have no talent shortage. We have unicorn shortage. I cannot hire someone like you guys, but I can hire a shit ton of people that are juniors. 
And because I can't afford you within my budget, I just say, oh, I have a talent shortage. No, I just can't afford you and you're too few. I can find a lot of juniors and beginners. So if I give them a mitre attack for everything, their life could be slightly better because now they know the procedural examples, mitigation and detection, they have the description, they have a common language to talk about with me, especially when they see anything in the sim or in any other queue. So how do I get them everything with mitre attack techniques? Well, you know, I can give them uh, something that I get from, I don't know, some, sometimes my EDR has mitre attack, right? Anybody here has mitre attack from the EDR? Yeah, a bunch of us. Uh, so sometimes the NDR would give you some, you know, but most of the data does not have mitre attack. And the mitre attack that you have was for marketing. It was for dashboards. It was for sexy stuff at RSA and Black Hat. It was not to actually use it. Uh, so ideally, we have a mitre attack that we can actually use that is not crowdsourced where every single one was given by a different author. Ideally, we have one thing that gives everything a mitre attack. How do I do that? I can just deed up everything in my sim and get all the different messages and signatures that would ever trigger and I, you know, hand annotate them. That's the version 0 0.1. Version 0 0.2 is to use an LLM like ChatGPT and let ChatGPT do it. Like I can go to ChatGPT um, and I say, you know, ChatGPT, what technique is happening here and there? And it would tell me, you know, uh, what MITRE technique is run DLL32 uh, registry run key, you know, uh, whatever. It will, it will tell me. It might not be good, but it could be consistent. Can ChatGPT be consistent? Uh, depends. But if you really are after consistency, you go to uh, a model that you can tune um, the API off. And if you tune the API, it would look something like this. You go to the settings on Hugging Chat. If you don't know about Hugging Chat, it's just a way to get LLMs tuned for your use cases. And you essentially choose any model and you can give it a lot of links for things that it should use, you know, uh, to do OSINT or to do whatever you want. Um, but essentially, let's create one together if you want. Um, let me figure out how do I create one. I can do this on my phone. I don't have to, you know, walk away from here empty handed. I can walk away with a new assistant that I can create and I can call a TTP uh, detector. And how do I do that? I close ChatGPT and I start any of these models. And the key here is temperature. Why is ChatGPT not consistent? It's creative, it hallucinates every now and then. That's why I don't know a single person in this room that uses an LLM for anything serious other than reporting or some sort of, you know, some sort of, um, how do I write this query or something like that, right? But you don't really depend on it because it hallucinates. If you drive down the temperature all the way down, it will stop hallucinating and it will be consistent. What is consistent or deterministic? It means same input, same output every single day. Same input, same output. And if I have that, I can technically use that for my classification. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, for now, let's talk about, okay, my dude, you need MITRE attacks for everything. Sure, give this guy all the MITRE attack he needs. Now what? Now the layer ones can actually understand what's going on when they open their sim and they see a million tickets for them to work on, a million notable alerts. However, how the hell do they work through the million? That's why we came here. How do we we do data reduction and go from a million notable alerts into, I don't know, 10 tickets, something that a human can actually do. Because if I have a million notable alerts, I'm only gonna tune my notable alerts to only have 20 extra, extra, extra spicy and I will never lay eyes on anything else. Anybody here has terabytes going into their sim? Like a day, terabytes? Fuck yeah, a lot of people, okay, nice. So do you ever look at any of that data? No. Why do you collect it? Compliance, fuck yes, yes, thank you. We do not collect it because we need it, we collect it because the boss wants it. So, <laughs> so essentially, um, what do we actually need? We need about 20 rules, 50 rules, 100 rules. 200 rules, that's about it. 200 rules, hopefully they don't trigger. When they trigger, I'm kind of worried. Do I ever investigate them? If I'm, the, if I'm in the right mood, if I'm in the right day, and one of them triggers, I will investigate them. But if you need me to do it super, super duper fast, I'll just close them right away. Uh, you know, you want the MTTD? I got you. So um, essentially, how do we find things that are relevant? Yes, 10 minutes to go. Um, how do we find things that are relevant? I have to essentially investigate what are the questions to ask, right? So what is relevant between this alert and this alert? Well, they share an entity, or maybe they don't share an exact entity. It's not a common entity. It's a similar entity. Can I put that in a rule or a playbook? No. There is no similarity in rules. You only have the exact same entity or not. 
these two entities are in the exact same business unit or not. They have the exact same operating system or not. Similar business units or operating systems or similar ports does not exist. There's no similarity. However, as a human, you're actually doing that. You're looking at similarity. You're looking at similar, even tickets historically, like there was something similar to this before and how did people do it if I have historical data on my tickets. But essentially I'm looking for event attributes like the EDR gives me a lot of attributes like parent process and whatnot, registry keys and yada, yada, yada. And the R would give me like packet size and so on and so forth, protocol, port. Um, and identity would give me a lot of events, you know, like what exactly happened in this? Was it like an account change? Was it, what the hell was it? But essentially I'm looking at event attributes. I'm looking at entities attributes, right? And in my brain, I'm doing similarity. Nice. You were talking about attack detection models. You said uh, I can do it with an LLM. Can you do any better, right? I can do a hugging chat. I can even do an Olama. If you don't know what's an Olama, um, you just go here to Olama and it's a local LLM instead of hosted in hugging chat or chat GPT or whatever the hell. You can just host it locally. You can do it in AWS with Bedrock, yada, yada, yada. But can I do better than just a vanilla LLM with the creativity turned all the way down on the temperature all the way down? Yes, you can. We did. We put three years into this. And we built a goddamn LLM that knows everything about cyber and it's open source and you can use it for free. You don't have to pay us ever. Uh, but essentially, how did we do that? We gave it a large unlabeled corpus, you know, all the stuff in your bookmarks, the books, the slides, the white papers, all the shit that you want to read, but you will never will. You just put it in bookmarks forever. Or if you're one of these guys like me, you just open a shit ton of tabs and your browser can't take it anymore. Yep. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Like we just gave all of that to the LLM and I took them off my bookmarks and now I have an LLM that actually read them from scratch. And uh, that LLM I gave a small labeled corpus to. And I can talk a lot about the small labeled corpus, but that's what took three years. Because I actually wanted a small labeled corpus of labels that I trust. Here's the alert, here's the mindset attack, and you cannot get that. That is so fucking hard. Humans are not consistent. We had to make one human sit down at the end and write regular expressions to keep themselves consistent when they tag something. Because every day they would tag something differently. It was so fucking hard. And then we had to like do data balance. Like this is so fucking hard. A small labels corpus, that's impossible. But again, open source already out there, use it. Um, but this is how you end up with essentially, like you have techniques for everything. Of course, it's actually probabilistic at the back end. Like I actually have a probability for every single class. But in this case, I was like, you know what? Anything above 99%, show it to me. And that was it. And it was pretty decent. And even if it was not decent, I don't give a shit. It's consistent and it's on everything. You have a PowerShell in my organization. I have a technique. You have a Windows event log in my organization. I have a technique. You have whatever the fuck that I get in my SIM. I have a technique. Even if I don't get it in my SIM, as long as it ends on my S3 bucket and it goes through this, I have a goddamn technique. And I can hire the 20 resumes that I got of juniors because they actually know what the hell is going on when they see something. They don't have to ask me, what is run DLL32? I don't fucking give a shit. You have to just say, what is T1218? And you have to read about it and you have to figure out how to mitigate and how to investigate about it. You can go to chat GPT and be like, I have a, two, a T1218. What should I do? What are the next steps? What should I investigate? And it would tell you, right? It's a common language. So anyways, now that I have that, I want to cluster events that are relevant. How do I, how do I cluster events that are relevant? Well, I can do it vanilla and I have code here uh, for essentially clustering and I just zoom in on the sexy eye candy but forget the eye candy for a second um, this is just like eye candy that shows you like clusters of events and whatnot but if I want to do much better and if I can actually hire a summer intern for data science instead of just you know DIY it myself I will tell them to use a knowledge graph what the hell is a knowledge graph clustering is unsupervised right Clustering is unsupervised, which means that it actually doesn't know where the hell is it going and it doesn't know what's right because you don't know what's right. You actually don't know what's right and you don't know how to guide it, but you know how to think. You know how to investigate to a certain degree. Anybody here has documentation? If I join as a new SOC analyst, how to, how to investigate something? One, okay, two, three, four, four. Okay, you guys are fantastic. Most people don't, right? Do you have historical tickets by any chance? Historical tickets, historical investigations, okay. About five, six people, okay, nice. Most of us, we're the normies, we're the 99%, we don't have shit, right? So it's all stuck in the brain of a unicorn sitting in my sock and without this unicorn, everything fails, right? So I know how That's to think. That's the failure of your unicorn. Right? Because the first thing we should be doing when we pull this stuff is writing out, oh, here's a little FAQ of 
how I do what I do. And it might not work for you, but you can see how my brain's going to work on it. And then you can adapt your brain to the same goal, at least. And oh, by the way, here's all the things I screwed up on so you don't make my mistakes. Yes, it's probably yes. there's also SOPs too, right? I mean, yeah. If you document what people are supposed to do, then yeah, the SOPs, the FAQs, who reached them? boilerplate. Oh dear lord! Yep. As much as you can boilerplate, boilerplate Hell yeah. your friend. Because yeah. if they have to spend right. hours crafting an IR and they've got seventy-five percent pre-written, put this here, put this here, make sure it all it makes sense. Here's where you put the actual details of what happened in the narrative. Yeah. And here's all the rest of the stuff that we just have to put in. Hell yeah. I mean, if you actually have some sort of documentation, that's fantastic. If you don't, you have to figure out how to put the knowledge out there. You can, you can, don't, don't lose hope. The knowledge is essentially is going to be encoded in some sort of data structure. And data structures are essentially pretty nice because they tell like the clustering algorithm what to look for. Clustering again doesn't know what to do. It's unsupervised, but you can make it semi-supervised and cheat your way a little and just give it knowledge. Tell it, you know, in my investigations, I always look for entities. Okay. So the entity is a node and the event is a edge. And between as, as an entity and Google or Ashley Madison or whatever you want, like, um, is essentially another entity. And these are the events that happened. And these events, essentially, I want you to cluster them thinking all the time in the cluster about what entities are involved. It's an entity centric way. But again, do you have the right process to have the entity attributes? Do you have the right stuff? It's about process. Because when you go to data science, it's about what data do you have, right? And also what knowledge do you have to put there? But given the right data, not the right data, given a good enough data and a good enough knowledge, you can actually get very useful clusters. And guess what? They compete with nothing. Today, chapter one machine learning and clustering competes with absolutely nothing because you have a bunch of humans that sit in your sock and they do whatever, but you don't actually know how do they correlate things because you don't document them. Clustering at least is fully transparent. It's auditable. It's actually explainable and you can track it down and you can give it feedback and it's very easy to give feedback. But also, you can also chain things in a finite state machine and in data science, we call those Markovian chains, but Markovian models are another way to say finite state machine. We just like to complicate things. But essentially they say that if you find a few steps, even if it misses a few because of zero days or whatnot, it's fine, put them together. And what you end up with is 2,500 alerts given with 180,000 events and logs, and they give you eight clusters. In reality, in the SOC, we only knew about one ticket or one cluster. And that one cluster had about 10 alerts and 10 alerts are essentially a lot. I don't think anybody has a ticket with 10 alerts, but that was not enough because that exact cluster had 202 alerts instead of 10. And of course, not all of these were good. Some of these were garbage, but we gave it feedback and it was fantastic. And when I showed it to my SOC people, it was like, okay, this is pretty good. What amazing technology, what alien technology is this? And I was like, this is chapter one machine learning. This is clustering. And you can give it feedback. This is chapter one. Fuck yeah. Like we're, we're working with rules. We're working with stuff and it's a big data problem. And we don't have a single big data solution because we're skeptical about anything that we don't understand. Clustering, you can understand down to the latest bit of it and you can give it feedback and you should use it. And it's open source. So essentially, um, if you want to take something from this, put techniques and everything. That's the what. And for investigations, welcome to cybersecurity. No one actually knows how do we do investigations correctly. We don't have proper documentation. We don't have a single even resource. We don't have a course about how to investigate stuff in the SOC that is unified and people know about. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, if you have a clustering algorithm, you have a way to unify how do you deal with this. And it scales. And it's not a GPU. It's not an LLM. It's $20 a month for a clustering algorithm to run through terabytes and terabytes of data every day. And it's fully explainable and you can give it feedback. Uh, but yeah, here's here's essentially a quick example that is technical, so I didn't completely bait you. Here's an input, and here's how you cluster it. You just say cluster zero has all of these, and you can give that to an LLM and write a report. LLMs are really good at writing reports. If I give this to, a, to an LLM, it will make me an amazing report I can give to my boss. But now when I look at a ticket, it doesn't have to be one alert, a notable alert. My ticket is one notable alert, 200 possibly relevant alerts, and if I have historical tickets, here is three relevant tickets from history so that I know what happened historically. But yeah, that's that's pretty much a, 
a wrap. This is how we compare against essentially other methods. It's actually efficient because you don't do rules, you don't do searches, and it's easier to adapt and maintain. And it's actually standalone. So when your boss changes the sim, you don't lose your work. It's standalone and it's a legacy you can leave behind you. Anyways, I appreciate you. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you guys for listening. I have a shit ton of stickers and I don't know, I can take a lot of questions uh, outside as well. I have a shit ton of stickers and I'd love to connect with you. You guys probably should connect with these guys. Um, there are innovative leaders. These are the kind of leaders, you know, that we have on camera saying they like juniors and they don't like MTTD. They don't like, you know, the old fashioned way of doing things. So these are the kind of leaders you probably want to work with, but I appreciate you.